You're listening to Into the Box, the brand new podcast series brought to you by Milton Keynes Dance Theatre, where we'll exclusively interview our artists as we delve into the creative process behind this youth dance company's latest production, Pandora. Hello, everybody. We hope you're all well. Hi. Here we are, the first episode of this new series. I'm very excited to be doing this. I know. I just can't wait to get in and talk to everybody because I feel like everyone has such great things to say about the production. You won't want to miss it, guys. I'm telling you that. No. (laughs) And on that note, if you subscribe to our podcast, then you can be notified every week of when it comes out. So you don't have to use any of that old brain power. (laughs) Also, you can rate us. Let us know what you think of the podcast. Yeah, any feedback would be great. So I'm Danielle, Danielle Casey. I am 16 years of age. And I am playing the role of Hephaestus in Pandora. Yes, you can pronounce it now. I can pronounce (laughs) it now. (laughs) She's got it. I am Harry Yo. I'm 15. And I am playing the role of Hermes in this production of Pandora. Not the delivery company, because Harry actually shows up on time. (laughs) (laughs) This first episode is actually going to be going out on the day that would have been Pandora's premiere. Oh, Do you know what? In some ways, it's a blessing and a curse just to not have it so soon. As somebody who's done quite a few shows where it's like, rush to the deadline, it's quite nice to have this extra period of refinement and reflection. We've got to look on the bright side, and it is great. We've got time to polish it, perfect it, make it the best show possible when it can get out there in April. But I just really miss being on stage, you know? I know, I do. I wish stupid corona would just go away (laughs) so we could get back to it. But if anybody else is feeling a bit down, whether you're in the show or you were coming to see it, we're going to cheer you up with this podcast. Absolutely. So do you think we should get into our first ever guest? Yes, let's introduce her. I'm excited. Me too. (laughs) So we are now introducing our first ever guest onto the show. and Here she is. This is Jess, Jess Yo. Hi, guys. And Jess is my sister, so we are Siblings. together. Yes. Yeah. Don't worry, guys, this is all COVID safe. Yes. And I'm at home on Zoom. I am not with them right now, so... This is a room we're very familiar with, as this is where you do your Zoom ballet. <laughs> oh, yeah, the Zoom ballet classes. With fireplace as a bar. <laughs> fireplace as a bar. Make do and men. Breaking yeah. the light nearly. We love that. <laughs> Didn't you grom Batman into the telly one time? <laughs> oh, I've grown Batman into the telly multiple times. <laughs> it's, it's very resilient. It won't give up. Yeah, it's like 80 years old. To move on to the production, Pandora. We have Pandora sitting right here, so... She is. Let's bow down to her. The man, the myth, the legend. (laughs) Guys, stop it, stop it. (laughs) In pretty much nearly in every scene, par from two in the show. Yeah, I mean, from my creation, I am on stage. It's very physical, very intense. It's full on. You pretty much have everything within your choreography in the sense of you've got partnering with God knows how many people. Yeah, Yeah, I think I've got like Both of us included. Both of us included. And it's interesting actually to do... I've got girl partners and boy partners. How do you find adapting to different partners? Because I cannot imagine it. It's definitely a challenge because every person and me have, like, a different dynamic. Yeah. Yeah. So when me and Harry partner, it's a funny dynamic because we're also brother and sister. Mm -hmm. So maybe we can treat each other in a way that I wouldn't treat Danielle. (laughs) Well, I think think you're much... You'd be much more inclined to tell me, no, you're doing it wrong, push me forward. You're crushing me me under your weight. (laughs) (laughs) Harry told me that I was crushing him under my weight. In my defence, I had been backed into a corner (laughs) where I was accused of not doing anything in this this lift that we had to do. And people were, you know, bandying my name around, but I I wasn't pulling my weight. And I said, I'll have you know my knuggles are crashing (laughs) under her weight. <laughs> but yeah. now it's been it's been taken out of context and used against me in every <laughs> which way. <laughs> See, like I always think watching you two dance together because you have quite a few pas de deux within the show. You're very synchronized in comparison to quite a lot of other dances. It's probably something like sibling telepathy. I think we do have a sibling connection. 
telepathically because we often start singing the same songs at the same time. We do, just randomly when we've not heard them. But then again, me and Owen are strangely in sync when we're dancing. I yeah. see that as well. Just as a disclaimer, Owen is the founder of the company. Yeah, He's the, the director. director of Milton Keys Dancers. Yeah. So. He choreographs, he pretty much does everything. And he dances in the show now, so... <laughs> yes. Because we choreographed Romeo and Juliet together, we have a lot of trust in each other and understanding of how each other's minds work, which is kind of nice doing a couple of choreography bits on Pandora as well. We both managed somehow to tune into each other's vision which I think works quite well. You bring up the whole sense of trusting each other through creation. When you started the company, obviously the first show was Romeo and Juliet. Could you just guide us through like how much work goes into creating a dance show with MKDT? That's definitely something that I really learnt from my role as assistant choreographer for Romeo and Juliet is really the logistics behind bringing a show together. So what you often don't see on the surface is the hours that go into music selection, creating motifs. So when we began generating material for both Pandora and Romeo and Juliet, we started at the end. So the first scene that we choreographed was the final scene. And from there, we can make motifs and little phrases that then we can sort of start to weave in as we work backwards to make sure that by the end of the show, everything has sort of culminated in this scene and the audience can go, oh, I saw that in Act One. Now it's sort of like a reflection upon the whole story. So Mm. that's something I really found very interesting. I know a lot of different choreographers have different ways of working, but... That's something I'll definitely take from Owen and apply to my own work. Mm. Well, our grandma does always say that working backwards is Is the the best best way way forward. forward. (laughs) And that seems to work in this instance as well. So on top of, like you've said, everything that goes into making a production, the music selection, you know, every little detail has to be thought about. The costumes is a major thing as well. On top of that for Pandora, the second full production, you also have the challenge of coming back from... Uh, nationwide you know pretty much global lockdown yeah so we started rehearsals with the cast for pandora i think it was september but we actually started choreographing and generating material late april early Mm. may over zoom which would definitely be interesting yeah so as i said we started with the last scene which me and owen made in february and then in April and May, we started on motifs for the different sins and sort of workshopping how we're going to take such a large concept and weave it into choreography so that it'll read to the audience. Because it's one thing explaining, oh yeah, wrath, it's a feeling of anger. But then it's another thing having the audience pick up on that message through movement. Because you had to choreograph it with Owen in such a really obscure way. Something that I really commend MKDT for being able to do is choreograph to the dancer once we were able to get back into the studio. Because our ethos of the company really is about creating these opportunities for people to learn and develop as dancers, not just as, you know, characters on stage. So we really try to involve all the dancers in the creative process. Number one, so they get an insight into it. And number two, so that they appear as strong as they can be on stage. So adapting to the dancer is something that we really try to emphasise. So it's lovely that you picked up on it, actually. (laughs) So you had all these challenges with Zoom, like the things that you would normally be able to do were completely limited. And yet, when we came back into the studio, the choreography felt just as good, just as versatile. How do you think you and obviously Owen were able to overcome the challenges? I think it definitely was a challenge, but... When we do group improvisations in creative classes for my personal training, the teachers always say sometimes it's really, really hard when you have no limits. And sometimes Mm. by adding limits, it brings about like more creativity. It forces you to think in different ways and approach things from a different perspective. So I think actually being so limited might have produced sort of different choreography 
more versatile. But also, we never choreographed a full phrase or anything over Zoom because we were obviously aware that it was going to need spacing and fleshing out in a studio environment. So really, over Zoom, we generated motifs that we could easily put on the dancers, check what worked, and then develop from there. So it's more starting points. Starting points is a really good thing to mention. We talked so much about the production, but what actually made you go, we're going to do Pandora, because there hasn't actually been a dance show of Pandora ever. No, never. So this was Owen's baby, really. He'd been nurturing it for some time (laughs) as a little seed of thought. And I think it was really the lockdown and everything that came to fruition last year. We started with the Australian bushfires and then there was obviously all the Black Lives Matter movement, which was so important. And obviously the political stance on the lockdown and how different countries reacted it was all these sort of different issues that so suddenly came to the surface as a company we thought well this could be a really relevant show to do right now because obviously it follows the seven deadly sins and we felt it was a good fit pandora is a show that's got something to say yeah it's it's definitely not a show that's There's a prince, there's a princess, fight, you know. Yeah. (laughs) Sword fight, Danielle. Should we have another one? Oh, my God. (laughs) So what Harry's referencing there is a Romeo and Juliet section where there was a sword fight. Killian and Benvolio. Killian and Benvolio had to fight. Unfortunately, on stage, I can't wear my glasses. So I was (laughs) sword fighting blind. And then you could just see Harry. I mean, bear in mind, I was already pretty terrified of the sword fighting. Harry's definitely a make love not war type guy <laughs> definitely <laughs> we ended up sword fighting i couldn't see harry there was a bit in the choreo where i had to push him back and he goes straight into the lights in the wings and <laughs> really? yeah there was just this big posh and I just, oh, <laughs> i'm against the lights ah <laughs> bless his heart he managed to save the lights because I had to carry on acting, of course, because I was on stage. So I was like, yeah, mean, aggressive. Uh. But in my head, I was going, oh, my God, the lights are going to fall. Actually, I was dressed all in black so I was on the side of stage. Mm. So I didn't know that that's what knocked the light. But oh, I had yeah. to do a I, me. <laughs> commando crawl across the wings and sort of adjust the light. And I had Owen in my headset going, no, left, no, right. <laughs> Yeah, so that's how that happened. (laughs) Yeah, but I mean, I wasn't hurt. I was absolutely fine. It just added to the drama. Added to the drama. Proper bit method acting. (laughs) Yeah, it was all planned, actually. Yeah, it was all planned. We talked about it before. (laughs) (laughs) And it really highlights how much MKDD kind of pushes you out of your comfort zone and makes you do things you've never tried. Because I was not expecting to go in and sword fight, but then before you knew it... (laughs) That's one of the most exciting things about the company, though, is that you go into it with maybe a preconception, but then you come out of it with so many extra skills. Oh, yeah. And the fact that it's such a diverse group of people. So, obviously, you'd never done stage combat before. No. <laughs> and you were a very ballet-heavy background, whereas David came from an acting background and he had done stage combat before. And it was yeah. how you two shared the skills and we brought them together on stage, which was really fun, actually. Yeah, just on the MKDT environment and that diversity that I think's really great... It's a company where you come in and you really have to embrace all of that diversity because you gain so much from it. In MKDT, we take the view of you can learn from everybody. So we learn from you guys. Me being in the cast, but also in my choreography sections, I learn so much from the dancers, their approach and what learning methods are best for them. And obviously we all learn so much from Owen. But then also we all learn from each other, I think. Totally. Going into my first MKDT production, I wasn't expecting that everybody would get on so well and help each other so much and it would just be a big it's kind of community. such a lovely community. environment. Yeah. And I'm not just saying for that for the Honestly, podcast. Honestly. I've been in companies before where it's been a bit catty. A bit dance mums. <laughs> a bit dance mums. And it doesn't feel that way in MKDT. It's, I hate to sound so cheesy, but all for one and one for all. I think it's because we're all working towards a common goal of the production, but also becoming better individuals and 
not just improving our technique, but also improving our creativity, improving our outlook, improving our collaboration. And I think that's something that is often quite overlooked, the like life skills as well that you get through dance. I think that must have played a part in obviously after Romeo and Juliet, people who had taken part in that went on to go to places such as Trinity, Trinity Laban, Laban, Ballet, Ballet Theatre Theater UK, UK, Italia, Italia Conti, yeah. <laughs> Chinks. This is the sibling <laughs> telepathy. This is the sibling thing. Ching Park. Don't forget oh, about yeah. Ching Park. Oh yeah. yeah. So it must have been about that whole holistic approach where it's about bettering us as people and as creative individuals. And yeah, because well. in, in the industry now, you can't just be a dancer. It's naive to think that you can I, make it yeah. with just your technique. Obviously, I haven't been in the industry. I'm hoping to go into the industry. <laughs> but I'm, I'm expecting to have to generate my own ideas and my own outlook. And You're going on about wanting to go into the industry yourself. And we know that our little Jess is going on and auditioning for schools. I'm auditioning for Northern Contemporary, London Contemporary, Rombert and Trinity Laban. So. I mean, I know because I've had to move the sofa out of the living room for all the online yeah, auditions. Yeah, I had a Zoom audition <laughs> for Northern Contemporary and me and Harry had to lift the sofas out of the yeah. living room. <laughs> with that amount of work that goes into being an assistant choreographer by taking on the MKDT attitude of just giving everything a go and trying and putting in all that hard work, do you think it's prepared you better for the industry? Absolutely. So much. Because when I go to interviews, I can say I've had experience as a choreographer, as an assistant choreographer, as a rehearsal director... That's just insane to think about. They're not really experiences you're meant to have until you've completed your degree. So Owen's support giving me these opportunities to really try out everything in the industry has 100% put me in a better position. I guess it's sort of, you've learned industry tricks from Owen. How would you know them, really? People exactly. auditioning don't know those things. And I feel like even, not just in my position, at the front, but also, as a cast member, the creative process is really exposed yeah. and raw. I'd hope that you guys are able to follow along and pick up these little things along the way as well. With you saying the process is really raw, the whole of Act 2 with the sim work, before we even started dancing, the groups sat down together and said, what are we going to base it on? We had to go out and we had to do our own research. Do you think... The amount of research that you've passed on from being creators to the cast, which isn't really that normal in dance theatre settings, helps progress us as dancers. What do you think about the I research think process? Definitely, because research is such a big part that's often hidden away. But if you go on to do medicine, if you go on to dance school, you're going to need those research skills... Mm. and planning skills and so on a basic skills level it's just very useful second it makes the performance so much more relevant to you guys because I feel like when you've done your own research you can begin to sculpt your character from your viewpoint and you don't have to do anything clever with it just literally milling the information around in your brain will enhance your performance Especially with the sins, when they're not characters, they're concepts. Taking the time to find the personal connection to it, I think, will really help. And we've talked to you a little bit before about how you created the character of Pandora. It would be really interesting to know the person who is dancing the role, what's going through your head when you're dancing her? Me and Owen had multiple Zoom calls about who Pandora is, so... On a basic level, she's a gift sent from the gods to Earth. She's made out of clay. She's the first woman. She's got a box and she takes the box and she's been given all sorts of gifts like clothing, beauty, strength, curiosity. And it's this curiosity that drives her to open the box, Curiosity releasing... killed the cat. <laughs> <laughs> releasing the seven deadly sins into the world, even though she was told not to open the box. So for me, I feel like she represents much more than just one being. I feel like it's not just Pandora, but it's more like Pandora's relationships mm. with all the sins and all the characters. 
So how does Pandora experience wrath, envy, lust? She's a very pivotal character in that she's the vector for the other things to be shown. Exactly. (laughs) I mean, the seven deadly sins are said to affect all mankind. So it's kind of a representation of that and what they can do. And so it isn't really just It's not just one body, it's more like everybody. Everyone will always experience these sins. The pride in the early medieval times and the greed in Wall Street. These are all different periods of time, but the sins are still so prevalent. So I think Pandora in 2020 and 2021 is sort of how the sins manifest themselves. So wrath will have been really experienced with the Black Lives Matter protests. I know greed and gluttony is based a lot on consumerism, but all of these themes came from not just me as Pandora thinking, ooh, how do I experience wrath? It came from us as a company. So we've talked about your growth. Do you know what's coming next for MKDT? How it can grow from here? So far, we've done Romeo and Juliet in the process of doing Pandora, which are all full-length two-act shows. So something we're definitely looking to do is, number one, more shows with a bigger age range. So we're going to do junior stuff and then the more senior stuff with the Pandora cast, which is up to 18 years old. Also, we're going to start playing with shorter productions, maybe more conceptual pieces as opposed to story pieces, workshops, come to the workshops and carrying on providing people with these opportunities more pre-vocational experience. You've obviously been with the company since it started. Since our very first coffee meeting (laughs) in a small Spanish cafe. (laughs) Me, Liv and Owen sat around a table. I had a hot chocolate, one of the nicest hot chocolates I've ever had in my life. And Owen said, right guys, I've had this idea. There's not any youth dance companies in Milton Keynes. Shall we do it? And we were like, yeah, absolutely. (laughs) And here we are. Thank you so much, Jess, for talking to us. You're welcome. I had a blast. Thank you so much. (laughs) (laughs) So we have one final little surprise. We have decided for you and also for all of our other guests on this series to create a quick fire question competition. Okay. Where we ask you, yeah, you're very competitive. (laughs) Especially in board games, always making up the rules so she can I win. I do not make up the rules so I can win. <laughs> Absolutely not. So are you up for it? I'm in, 100%. You're going to have one minute. I'm keeping track of time this week and of scores. Right. Jess, are you ready? Okay, I'm ready. I've just had a massive adrenaline rush. I'm feeling very nervous. Let's start the time once I finish the first question. Okie dokie. Okay. So, Jess, first dance show you were in. Start the Swan time. Lake. What's one of your nicknames? Jessie. Worst food? Uh, meatballs. Proudest moment? Uh, GCSE results. Biggest pet peeve? Uh, slow walkers. Are aliens real? Yes. Most embarrassing moment? Um, when I put two backpacks on my back, fell into a puddle in front of a year 11 graphics class when I was in year 7. <laughs> <laughs> Favourite style of dance? Contemporary. Are you more motivated by criticism or praise? Praise. Party trick? Uh, rolling around in splits on the floor. <laughs> Advice to your younger self? Work hard, be nice to people. Have you seen a ghost? I've never seen a ghost. Favourite school subject? Maths. Biggest fear? Uh, dying alone. Middle name? Mabel. Would you travel to the past or the future? Uh, the past. Most nervous you've ever been? GCSE results. Favourite place to travel? Mallorca. Best moment of 2020, if there are any. Ooh, uh, Romeo and Juliet, the final show. Any allergies? Uh, gluten. Biggest idol? Idol? Uh, I don't know, my mum? <laughs> so, think... Ooh. No! I have 21. 21, that's quite good. Congratulations. That is absolutely buzzing right that now. That is a high bar. That's going to be tough to beat. What do I get if I win? A pat on the back. <laughs> you get the pride, although that is a sin. Pride is a sin, guys. So, Watch out. So maybe you don't want to win. <laughs> Maybe I don't. W- I do want to win. You do I desperately want to, want to win. She, she wants the win, but she doesn't want the. <laughs> I don't ego. want the sin. I want the win, but I don't want the sin. 
<laughs> well done. Very good. I wasn't expecting you to do that well. I don't mean to, you know, fall <laughs> down to you, but that was Because I was good. crushing him <laughs> under my weight. <laughs> Yet again, taken out of context. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jess, for joining us. It's been an yeah. absolute Thank pleasure. Thank you for having me. We've had a... Lo- well, I don't know about you, Danny. I've had a lovely time. I've had a lovely time. I've had a great time. It's been a laugh. That's all <laughs> three of us then. <laughs> <laughs> That's all from us. And uh, we'll see you next time. Yes. Bye. Bye. Bye, everybody.